One of the things that we need to be able to do at A-level is to evaluate the accuracy and precision with which we carry out certain experimental techniques. Uh, I'm going to have a look at titration in this particular video. In my example, it's going to be an iodine thiosulfate, which is a very common titration. I am going to assume that I do not know the concentration of my iodine solution. So concentration is unknown. Volume is going to be 25.0 centimetres cubed. And that is going to be pipetted into my conical flask. During the course of this titration, the iodine solution, which is a brownish colour, slowly fades away to colourless. And we can use a starch indicator to help us ascertain an accurate end point. Why use a volumetric pipette rather than a measuring cylinder? So a volumetric pipette is able to measure a volume with far greater precision. It looks a little like this if you're unfamiliar with the actual technique of a titration. I suggest you go and check out some of the excellent videos on YouTube. But essentially, if we fill up our pipette so that the meniscus is sat directly on this line here and we're looking at that at eye level then we can say that we have got a volume of 25.0 centimeters cubed however in all glassware there is going to be an error associated with the manufacturer of that glassware and it's generally printed on the um, glassware itself or you can look it up in the um, books or at A level during an exam question it's going to be actually quoted on the exam paper. So for a 25.0 centimetre cubed um, volumetric pipette the error is plus or minus 0.06 centimetres cubed which means that I can figure out the percentage error associated with this particular measure so it's always the error over the uh, quantity measured. So ever over quantity measured, quantity measured times 100. And that comes out at 0.24%. So that is very, very precise. A measuring cylinder um, by comparison has an error of around about two to four percent so by using a volumetric pipette and they do come in different sizes um, i can make sure that i am measuring this out as precisely as possible into my burette i'm going to place a solution of sodium thiosulfate i'm going to make this solution up myself from scratch from the actual crystals so i'm going to know the concentration I'm going to make it up to be one mole per decimeter cubed. And at the end of the experiment, the titration, I will know the volume because the volume will be the titer, as in the amount of thiosulfate added from the burette into the flask in order to um, completely react with the iodine that's present there. So, if I want to make up a solution of sodium thiosulfate, once again, I want to do this as accurately and precisely as possible. Um, I would like my solution to have a concentration of 0.1 mole per decimeter cubed. And my volumetric flask has got a volume of 100 centimeters cubed. Once again, you can see that there is a lovely line there. And if I fill it, so that the meniscus is sat directly on that line when I'm looking at it at eye level, then I will know that I have got a solution of 100 centimetres cubed. Um, a lot of glassware is still marked in millilitres. Remember, one millilitre is one centimetre cubed. So how do I go about making up the solution? What's the error associated with this? Well, if I would like to make up this solution, what I actually need to know is the mass of sodium thiosulfate that I need to weigh out. So this is going to be very straightforward. Um, I'm going to work out number of moles I need first. And the number of moles is going to equal the concentration times the volume. Concentration is 0.1. The volume is 100, but that's in centimetres cubed. So I need to turn that into decimetres cubed before I can go any further. And that is 0.01 moles. Now, unfortunately, my balance doesn't work in moles, so I need to convert that into a mass. Once again, very straightforward, mass equals 
number of moles times the molar mass. So that's 0.01. The molar mass of sodium thiosulfate is 158. So that's 1.58 grams. When I weigh this out, um, if we have a look at a balance, I think you're starting to be able to see why I didn't follow an artistic career here. Ooh. So I can put in my spoon out, spatula out, my sodium thiosulfate. The error associated with my balance depends on whether I can read my balance to two decimal places or three decimal places. If I'm reading it to two decimal places, so for example, I weigh out 1.58 grams, that'll be plus or minus 0.005 grams. If I'm using a three decimal place balance, maybe I weigh out 0.582 grams, plus or minus 0.005 grams. You can see the pattern here, I hope it's a five plus however many decimal places your balance reads to. So once again, I can figure out the error associated with my balance reading because it's going to be, let me just make some space here. I'm going to go back up to the top, and VDD, remove all that. It's going to be, uh, let's go with the two decimal place reading, 0.005, over 1.58, sorry, times 100. Okay, so that's how I work out the error associated with the actual balance. Once again, the volumetric flask itself has an error associated with it, and a manufacturer's error, and it's written on the flask. Uh, you can look it up in a book, of course, obviously at A level, it's going to be in the question. So the volumetric flask, uh, this particular one has a error associated with it of 0.1 centimetres cubed. So for the volumetric flask, the error is going to be 0.1 over the amount that I can add. Well, the volume of the flask is 100 centimetres cubed times 100, 0.1%. So we can now figure out that the errors associated with the experiment before we've even got going involve making up of the standard solution in terms of um, the mass reading, the volumetric flask, and also pipetting our iodine solution into our conical flask. So now I'm ready to carry out my titration. I have iodine solution as a starch indicator in my conical flask and I filled my burette with sodium thiosulfate and I've taken my initial reading and my initial reading here is 0, 0.00 centimeters cubed. Okay, so um, important point here. Once again, when I am reading a burette, let's make that 24.0 centimeters cubed. Let's make that one there. 24.1 centimeter cubed. Now, I can read my burette so that the meniscus is either sat directly on the line, in which case my reading would be 24.10 centimeters cubed, or it might be between two lines, in which case it would be 24.05 centimetres cubed. So essentially the five indicates that I'm between two lines on the um, burette. And this is when we are looking at it at eye level. Okay. So this means that I can read my burette to two decimal places. So every single reading in my results table must be to two decimal places. Either it's a zero because meniscus is sat directly on the line or it's between two lines in which the case, the uh, second decimal place is a five. Okay, so I do a rough titration. 
21.00 centimetres cubed added before the iodine solution on case of starch indicator um, goes colourless. Uh, I'm then going to carry out um, some more accurate titrations and, result, and record the results. And I've done it three times here. One of the things that you might be asked to do is to work out the average titer. OK, don't fall for the trick. The average titer is the average only of your concordant titers. A concordant titer um, are titers that are within 0.1 of a centimetre cubed of each other and they do not include the rough. So you can see here that I would want to be averaging 19.45 and 19.40. They are within 0.1 centimetres cubed of each other. 19.65 is not, so I'm not going to include that in my average. So when you are um, doing this under exam conditions, um, they expect you to write it out. I know. So 19.45 plus 19.4 um, divided by two. So it comes out at 19.425, 425. But remember, we can't read a burette to three decimal places, only by, to two, so we need to round up. So the answer would be 19.43 centimetres cubed is your average titer. The error associated with a burette is plus or minus 0 0.05 centimetres cubed. But once again, you need to be careful here because in order to work out a titer, we take two measurements, each one having an error of 0 0.05 centimetres cubed. So to work out the percentage error on our titer, it's going to be 0 0.1, because I have read that burette twice, over my average tighter times 100 and that comes out to be 0.52 percent okay so just to be clear on that when we're reading a burette we read it twice to get the tighter so we need to double the error hence the percentage error is 0.1 over our average tighter not uh, 0.05 OK, so just to summarise here, the errors associated with carrying out the titration as far as equipment is concerned, we have got the volumetric flask, the balance, as I've mentioned, PET, the balance of volumetric flask and the burette. They're all very, very tiny. Human error, however, is always going to be the bigger of the errors when we're carrying out any experiment and titration is no different. So what are the errors associated um, that are just down to us. Firstly, is our ability to judge the meniscus. So if we're making up our um, actual um, solutions in the volumetric flask for using the volumetric pipette, making sure that the meniscus is exactly on the line when um, making up the solution and withdrawing that certain specific volume. Um, also in um, judging the readings on the burette in order to work out the titer. Um, indicator. You should be adding two to three drops of indicator. Otherwise, you may find that the end point becomes quite stable, in which case it takes more solution added from the burette to shift it. Um, and of course, that then is going to affect our titer. In this particular case with starch, this is a really good example. In this um, experiment, I wouldn't actually add the starch indicator right at the beginning um, into my flask. I would let the thiosulfate run into the iodine <coughs> excuse me, until it gets to straw colour. Then I would add a few drops of the starch indicator, which would turn a blue-blackish, and then continue until it went colourless. Um, using a white tile underneath... Our conical flask is really important because it helps us judge the end point uh, when the indicator changes in whichever way that it's going to. Also that we are swirling our conical flask as we um, add 
um, the contents of the burette into it. Um, and finally, um, we need to be adding dropwise towards the end point. So when we know when the indicator is about to change colour, you would slow the burette right down and literally add it one drop at a time. Give it a good swirl, let it sit for a few seconds and see whether you need to add another drop. Those are all the things that we can do to kind of minimise our human error, but human error is always going to outweigh equipment error.